Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, Protecting Encryption Keys with Azure Key Vault. Uh, my name is Stephen Horns. So, rough agenda of what we're going to go through today. So, we're going to talk a little bit about data breaches. We're going to do a very quick high-level cryptography overview, just so everyone's on the same page in terms of cryptography or encryption. Then we're going to talk about some different key management options that are available to us, which will lead us into talking about Azure Key Vault more specifically. And then we're going to go through some different patterns and practices you can use when using something like Key Vault. So first of all, I just want to sort of set the scene by talking about the threat of data breaches. So there's a, an interesting website here called um, Breach Level Index. Now, they're a security consultancy in the US, but I quite like their website because they have these very big glaring statistics up on the page, which is um, quite useful to show uh, leadership in businesses when you're trying to convince them to take security more seriously. So the number at the top there um, indicates that since 2013, and I think these are more US-based statistics, but they're still kind of relevant, um, that there's been 13.5 billion records stolen or lost from companies since 2013. But the sad thing is that number doesn't actually, you know, it doesn't surprise me anymore. The number's are getting bigger. It seems to be getting bigger every day. The bit that does um, surprise me is this bit down here, where it says that only 4% of these data breaches were considered to be secure data breaches. That's where the data is encrypted. So, you know, the data gets stolen from a company, but it's useless because it's all encrypted and you can't read it. So really the reason why I go around doing talks like this and a lot of my other sort of friends and speakers go around doing security talks is to try and get that number to increase. So if you look at some examples here, some sort of large companies. So at the top there you've got JP Morgan Chase, sort of huge, huge banking organization lost 83 million records in a data breach. Uh, Equifax, which is a um, credit referencing agency, lost a hundred, nearly 150 million records in a data breach. And uh, Target, you know, the US supermarket chain, 110 million. MySpace, which I'm surprised is even still a thing, but apparently it is, lost 360 million records and so on. So these are quite big examples, but it can also happen to much smaller companies as well. So also, if anyone's familiar with uh, Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned website, um, well, if you're not familiar with it, it's a breach notification website where you can sign up your email address. And if your email address appears in any breaches, you get notified, so you can change your passwords. But again, there's some interesting stats on here from some other companies. Again, MySpace is on there. LinkedIn lost 165 million. Adobe, 152 million. You know, a lot of these are companies that we all probably use every day. So let's look at some of the effects of data breaches. So to a company, there's quite a lot of um, con uh, sort of negative consequences that can happen. So you can have reputational damage to the organisation. That's very difficult to recover from if your reputation becomes damaged. That can lead to a loss of sales, which can then mean you know, customers switching to a competitor. And once someone's switched to another company, it's very difficult to get them to switch back. You can have legal action from customers or other companies. So you know, that's expensive and time consuming. And as well as uh, compliance costs, so if you're in a regulated environment, so finance, health, uh, maybe even military and government, then there can be a lot of compliance costs as you get fines uh, levied onto your organisation. But also, most importantly, I think, is that you can compromise the safety of your customers. So if we look at the effects on, on an individual, so as an individual, you're having your data, your personal data being lost. Now, certainly in Europe, under GDPR, you own that data, it belongs to you. So something that belongs to you is being taken without your permission. So this can lead to identity theft and impersonation, which can then also lead to a loss of financial data or maybe even a loss of money if someone's stolen your card details. And it could also compromise your transaction histories on websites. So if you've been buying something that you, know, you maybe don't want anyone else to know about, that information can be, uh, can be leaked, which is quite bad. But the mindset I think we should all be in is that data breaches are inevitable. They're very difficult to stop. So it's not a case of if you're going to suffer a data breach, it's more of a case of when. And I think that's a kind of healthy mindset to get into. You know, you may, as an organisation, spend hundreds of thousands of you know, dollars or pounds on you know, network, perimeter security, firewalls, intrusion detection systems, and they're good, you know, don't stop doing that. But that doesn't necessarily stop um, a disgruntled employee in operations who maybe didn't get his promotion that he wanted or she wanted doesn't stop them from going into a database and select starring all of your data from the tables and copying it into a spreadsheet and taking it out of the building. A large proportion of data breaches do happen from within inside companies, not necessarily external breaches. 
So GDPR, obviously for us, is a very big thing, being in Europe. Well, I'm not going to say too much about Europe, because I'm from the UK, so it's slightly embarrassing. <laughs> We're supposed to leave today. Oh, God. But um, GDPR is a real big issue as well, because under GDPR, as I said, you as an individual own your data. The company is just a custodian for it, so lots of big fines could be levied towards companies. So that kind of sort of sets the scene around why you know, things like Azure Key Vault or any kind of Key Vault in cryptography is important. We're trying to protect our company's reputations and we're trying to protect our customers from having their data stolen. So I'm going to do a very, very high level um, crypto overview um, just so everyone's on the, sort of the same level playing field. <coughs> so broadly when it comes to encryption, we have two types. We have symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. So with symmetric encryption, we have things like AES, or if you're having to deal with a lot of legacy systems, you may still have to deal with DES or triple DES, although that's not recommended for new systems. But the reason it's called symmetric is because you have one key, and you use that to both encrypt and decrypt information. So that's why it's symmetric. On the flip side to that, we have things like RSA and even elliptic curve, which are called asymmetric, because we have a mathematically linked public and private key, which is used for encryption and decryption. So if I wanted to send someone some encrypted data using RSA, I request their public key, or get their public key, encrypt the data, send it to them, and then they use their private key to decrypt that data. So they're the only ones who ever have access to that private key. So symmetric encryption, the benefits are that it's very fast, it's very algorithmic in nature, it takes data, splits it into blocks, and performs operations against it. Computers are very good at that. But the downside to symmetric encryption is that sharing keys is very hard. I mean, if you've got this you know, AES encryption key, how do I get it to one of you? Certainly not going to email it to you. Probably don't want to stick it on a file on a server. Not going to want to put it in a database. And you know, sticking it on a USB key doesn't sound like a particularly good idea either. So getting that key to other people is difficult. Whereas on the flip side, things like RSA and elliptic curve, because they're more mathematical in how they work, so you know, based on modulus arithmetic, they're a lot slower for a computer to perform by an order of magnitude compared to, say, um, AES. But it does make the key sharing um, system easier because you, pu you share a public key, which anyone can have access to, but you keep your private key secret. So there's no compromising of the private key. Well, there shouldn't be any compromising of the private key. Now, traditionally in .NET, if we were going to do some encryption, we might use classes like AES Crypto Service Provider for doing AES encryption. And we might use things like RSA Crypto Service Provider for doing RSA-based encryption. Both fairly straightforward to use, but there's you know, definite advantages and disadvantages to both systems. So moving on from that and sort of talking about sort of key management and how do we manage keys, so, you know, there's lots of different options out there that we could use. I mean, probably the worst is this one where you just stick your RSA keys in an XML file and stick them on a server somewhere. I've worked for two companies now that have done this. You know, turn up on the first day and say, oh, where do you store your keys? Oh, they're on that server in D drive. Oh. So that's not very good. Obviously, anyone can access the server potentially within the organisation. Just take a copy of those keys. Another method that's very common is the use of certificates. You know, certificates are very well known, very easy to use effectively. And they give details about who the certificate is issued to and from. It allows you to do public key verification. You can install it directly onto servers or key stores in Windows, for example. And you know, they're a robust and proven mechanism. They don't really require any uh, involvement from the end user. So if you're buying a particular piece of software that uses certificates, they're probably just going to get installed behind the scenes for you. Or you have um, operations staff that will handle them for you. Don't really require any additional hardware, although you can use hardware to store them. They're easy to manage and they're supported by pretty much every you know, enterprise system out there. Linux, Windows, Mac, they're all supported. But the next best option is using something called a hardware security module. So these are rack mountable appliances that you'll put in a data center. Typically you'd have two of them co-located in different data centers so that the keys can be um, replicated between the two devices. And these allow you to do things like store keys and perform encryption on device. These devices are typically tamper-proof, so if anyone tries to physically access the box, there'll be light and radiation sensors in there, which will basically make the entire system shut down, so you have to send it back to the manufacturer. So they're designed to be tamper-proof. Um, and you can also use them as a way of storing certificates as well, so if you want to put private keys of certificates on there, that's typically what you can do with 
um, HSMs as well. But the problem with HSMs is traditionally they've been very cost prohibitive. So the companies that I've worked at that have used them have all been huge um, healthcare pharmaceutical companies or banks. Because typically these devices might cost anywhere from you know, 50 to 80,000 euros per device. So then quite expensive. But luckily for us, um, Microsoft have reduced that cost for us by hiring, well, buying lots of these devices, putting them in their different regional data centers, and then providing an interface for us to access them. So whilst this talk and all the demos I'm going to show are kind of focused around Azure and Key Vault, the principles kind of, and the patterns that we're talking about kind of apply to any other vendor as well. So AWS has the AWS HSM and KMS services. There's the Google Cloud KMS as well, kind of offers similar features and similar functionality. So even if you're not directly going to use Azure Key Vault, kind of the principles do apply to other, other providers. So with that, let's take a bit of a look at Azure Key Vault. So Key Vault is a service that lets you safeguard cryptographic keys and secrets used by cloud apps and services. And what Microsoft have done is they've bought lots of these devices. This is the Thales Enshield Connect hardware security module. Not quite sure how much these cost. I did go on their website to find out, but then a sales agent wanted to phone me, which to me says expensive. So I wasn't willing to have that phone call. But what Microsoft have done is they've provided an abstraction over you know, hundreds or thousands of these that they have in their regional data centers so that we can use them for minimal cost, which is great. Azure Key Vault, there's two configurations you can set it up in. It's called hardware and software mode. Uh, the common feature across both of them is that all of your keys are always stored on the HSM hardware. So if you generate RSA keys, they're always stored on the secure hardware. If you use the software configuration, then any encryption and decryption operations will happen on compute VMs inside the Azure VM, uh, inside the Azure Key Vault service. If you use the hardware um, configuration when you set it up, then your encryption and decryption operations are performed on the HSM hardware directly, but there is a, an extra cost implication to doing that. So a typical recommendation is if you're using Azure Key Vault, for your dev and test environments, you might use the software configuration because it's cheaper to use. But then for production, you might use the more robust hardware configuration. API-wise, there's no difference in it. It's just a little bit different when you set up the key vaults. So looking at some uh, example costs. So for non-key operations, this is things like writing secrets, which we'll go into in more detail in a bit. It costs three cents, three US cents per 10,000 operations. So if you write 10,000, well, read and write 10,000 secrets from the key vaults, that will cost you three cents. Um, certificate operations will cost you three dollars per renewal request, and then a further three dollars, oh, sorry, three cents per ten thousand operations, across both the standard and premium um, pricing tiers. If you're doing um, software operations with encryption keys, so you know by using the compute VMs, then for RSA two thousand and forty eight bit keys, it will cost you three cents per ten thousand operations across both um, standard and premium. But if you're using higher strength 3,072 or 4,096 uh, 4 bit keys, it will cost you 15 cents per 10,000 operations. In the hardware mode, this is where all your encryption and decryption happens directly on the hardware. You can't use the standard pricing tier, you have to use premium. And there's some additional costs. So for every key that you create, that's going to cost you $1 for the lower strength RSA key. And then 3,000 cents per 10,000 operations. And then if you use the higher strength keys, there's a tiered pricing model. So it's, what, $5 for the first 250 keys, and then the price sort of goes down in a staggered tier. So there's some sort of, you know, example highlight costs. Costs do change over time, so always check the Azure pricing calculator when you're looking to use any of these things. But they kind of give you an idea of the sort of level of cost it is compared to what it would be to buy one of these machines. So out of curiosity, how many keys... Would you, have, would you work with your <coughs> uh, entirely depends on your system. I'm going to give an example of a system I worked on at an insurance company, which will give a, probably a better impression to that. But it, I guess the real answer is it depends. depends on what you're building. But we'll, we'll cover an example a bit later. So once a key goes into the key vault, uh, it never comes out. 
So once you've generated a key in there, you can't then just copy the key out of the key vault, it's in there permanently. There is the facility to back up your keys in Key Vault, but Microsoft will encrypt them first before they back up. So you do have the ability to back the keys up, take a copy, and then restore them later, should you need to. But those keys are encrypted, so you can't actually directly access the key material. So setting up Key Vault is relatively straightforward. Um, always the best place to go is Microsoft's documentation. So the, the Getting Started page is down there. It does change over time, so you always need to consult the latest documentation. But broadly, if you're setting this up with PowerShell, you would create a resource group. You then create your key vault, specifying the region, uh, the resource group, and whether you want it in hardware or software, or the pricing tier. And once you've done that, you have the ability to create hardware and software keys, read and write secrets, and upload certificates. So from a PowerShell point, oh, it's a bit cut off on the side of the screen there. But from a PowerShell point of view, you connect to your subscription, create a resource group, and then you've got these commands down here where you uh, create the uh, key vault by giving it a name, resource group, location, and then you can give it a SKU, pricing SKU. Once you've done that, you can then access the key vault uh, via the standard portal, just like you can with any other Azure resource. So it lets you look at you know, what's happening over time. It lets you look at metadata for keys and secrets and certificates. So you can administer it from that portal if you desire. So that's great. You know, a lot of Microsoft services use Key Vault directly behind the scenes to manage encryption keys. But what we want to do is we want to access it from C Sharp. We want to code against the Key Vault. So to do that, there's an extra step we need to do. So we need to create an authorized application using Azure Active Directory. Sounds worse than it is. But effectively, this is going to give us an application ID and a shared secret that you have to present to the Key Vault to use it. There is a better method for doing that a little bit later, because it seems a bit icky having to provide credentials to access the Key Vault. But there is an option, other option we'll look at in a moment. But effectively, you, have, you create an application in Azure AD. You then have to make a note of the application ID, which is this thing here. So that's effectively your username, I guess is a good way of putting it. Then you have to make note of your client secret, which is this value here. When you go on that panel, it only shows you the client secret once. Once you've viewed it once, it won't show you it again. So you have to make sure to make note of it at that point. If you don't, you need to kill that application and create a new one. And then you can assign permissions for that application. So you can say whether that application is allowed to you know, read and write keys, delete keys, write secrets, etc. Okay, so once you've done that, oh, yeah, so it's, example there, you've got some different permissions that you can set on the left. There is another thing you can do. So if you're going to be um, using things like Azure App Services or Azure Functions to deploy your applications into, you can set up what's called a managed service identity. And what this means is that you can point to your application to that managed service identity and that handles the loading in of the credentials when your application starts up. So you don't have to present the um, app ID and client secret directly. So if you're doing that, that's probably a better technique to use. There's some interesting blog posts there that talk about how to set it up. But if you're not hosting your web API or websites on Azure App Services, um, then you have to present the user ID or well, the application ID and client secret from your application. <coughs> okay, so keys versus secrets. So keys, as you can imagine, are encryption keys. On Azure Key Vault, they're asymmetric RSA keys that you can create. But we can also store things called secrets, which we're going to look at some demos a little bit later. So a secret is, effectively it's like a key value pair store that you can use the Key Vault as. So you can write in secrets like database connection strings, database passwords, API keys, which you can store in the key vault so you don't have to store them inside your config files, which is quite a neat solution. So we're going to be playing around with some code. I've got all the code available on GitHub, and you can get it from that address there. Um, it's, I've released it under the MIT license, so you can do what you want with it. Just don't blame me if it doesn't work. But the code's all there that we're going to go through in a moment. So if you want to play around with this stuff at your leisure, you can do. When you set up Azure Key Vault, you have to install a NuGet package. 
so Microsoft.azure.keyvault. As you can tell, that's a Mac screenshot, so it, you know, it's .NET Standard 2 compliant, so it works in .NET Core, which is quite handy. So let's look at a simple Hello World application for Key Vault. This is where we hope that the Wi-Fi holds out for us. So in the solution that you can download from GitHub, I've got various little um, sample applications in here that you can play around with. Ignore the fake Key Vault class. That's just my insurance policy in case the Wi-Fi gives up and um, whilst doing the demo. I've basically, I've replicated some of the functionality locally with what the Key Vault's doing just so I can get through the demos. So you don't need to worry about that class. That's just, that's just in case the Wi-Fi dies. And it does frequently happen. Got some helper classes here um, with some methods that I've created. So we have the ability to create keys and delete keys, encrypt and decrypt, and get and set secrets. Then I've got some sort of boilerplate code here, which I'm using. So in this example, obviously, I'm just, I've set up a temporary key vault, which I'll keep online for a little while. So if you do want to download the code over the next week or so and just have a play around with it, I have got a pre-set up key vault you can experiment with. Obviously don't abuse it, because if anyone starts abusing it, I'll just have to delete it and set up a new one. So this is that application ID that we talked about, and this is that client secret, which I got from the um, portal. Obviously, if you are presenting these directly and not using managed service identities, you do need to think about how you're going to protect these values. It's like a chicken and egg thing, isn't it? You know, at what point does the security start? One company I worked at, they had some um, self-signed certificates that were loaded onto a protected server, and then we encrypted these values using the keys in that certificate. And that was how they got around that particular problem. OK, so let's look at this example here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a key. I'm calling it Stephen Hans's key, because it's my key. So we create it here. Then I've got some simple, a bit, bit of data here. There's a string. Then I'm going to encrypt it and decrypt it on the key vault. And then I'm going to delete my key afterwards, just to keep this particular instance nice and tidy. Okay, so I'm creating the key vault. They're uh, creating the, the key. As you notice, know, there was a bit of latency in doing that. That's partly because of the bad Wi-Fi here, but also, you know, you're having to go off to a key vault which I've got set up in the US, create the key, and then return the ID for that key back to us. So there is, you know, a performance penalty in using the key vault. But that gives us back a key ID. That's a bit hard to see, but it's a URI that just refers to the key that I've created. It's just like a unique ID for that key. So then I've got some data I want to encrypt, so I'm going to encrypt the string hello world. I'm then going to call out to the key vault. So I pass in my key ID, I pass in the data I want to encrypt. You have to convert it to a byte array first, so you need to play around with encodings and stuff. But I convert it to a byte array and then I'm just going to call out to the key vault. So key vault client is their um, client class that you call in their NuGet package and return the result. Then again, I can decrypt it. So this byte array here contains all the encrypted data from the key vaults. This one contains a byte array of my decrypted data. And then obviously I need to convert those into strings. So that's a base 64 encoded version of my encrypted data. A bit difficult to read, I apologize. And then we've got the decrypted data there which says hello world. So we've encrypted it and then decrypted it using the Azure Key Vault in an Azure data center somewhere. And then I delete my key just to stay tidy. So that's kind of a hello world application of using Key Vault to do a simple encryption decryption operation. Okay, so with that, let's look at a few, <coughs> a few little usage patterns around using the Key Vault. Again, a lot of these patterns kind of apply to AWS Key Manager and Google Cloud's KMS as well. Obviously, we're just looking at a specific Azure implementation. Okay, so we're going to look at six different items. So multiple environments, configuration of secrets, local key wrapping, key versioning, where we can use password protection, where we can improve password protection using the Key Vault, and digital signing and digital signatures. 
So multiple environments. So it's quite common then when you're developing an application that you're going to have numerous development tests, UAT environments, and then production. You know, so typically we promote our code through different environments into production. So one thing you don't want to do is just have one shared key vault and you use it for everything. Because then, you know, effectively you're making your production keys available to your other test environments. So that's not a good idea. You don't want to do that. Something you might want to do is you could have one shared key vault that you use for your test environments and then a specific key vault for production. That's quite a common usage scenario. Or if you script up your environments, then obviously you may as well just have one key vault per environment. But the key thing is that you never share keys from production into any other environment. You need to keep that production only and keep it locked down. Make sure your operations staff securely lock that key vault down. <coughs> Okay, so configuration of secrets. So secrets are a maximum of 25k blobs of text that you can store inside the key vaults. Now you don't have to create a specific encryption key for these secrets, that's handled by a key vault for you. So the best way to think of it is it's just like a key value pair, no SQL database, but stored in specific hardware. So everything's encrypted for you. Typical things you might want to install, so database connection strings. You know, it's, ne it's never a good idea to have those in your config files. So you could store those in there. API keys for third-party services. So if you use any third-party integrations and they've given you API keys to access those systems, you can store those away securely. Uh, Redis cache connection strings, you know, or just anything confidential that you don't want to expose in your source code or to any user. So they really are sort of very handy. Secrets are versioned as well, so if you write the secret or if you write a secret with the same identifier twice, it will keep a version for you, which is quite handy. And then when you retrieve a secret, if you don't specify a version number, it will just give you the latest version. But you can specify previous versions if you want, so that might be something that could be useful in your application design. So let's have a look at that. So the good thing is with Azure Key Vault, a lot of these things are actually very easy to use. So I'm hoping you can help use it as a way of proving to employers that this stuff's actually quite easy to do. You know, let's not push the security features to the back of the project. Let's think of them up front. So all of the helper files in here are the same as the previous project. So literally it's a few lines of code. So I'm going to create a secret. Maybe had a little lamb. And then I'm just going to retrieve it straight away from the database, uh, from the key vault. Okay, so that's my secret has now been written into the key vault. So it's got the secret name of Stephen Haunts' secret and the value is Mary's had a little lamb. But it could be a database password. Now I'm just going to retrieve it. So I'm retrieving it by name, you know, Stephen Haunts' secret, and then I get a string back with my secret in there. So that could be a database password, API key, anything that you want to keep confidential. Okay, so local key wrapping. So it gets a little bit more um, complex, but not by too much. So encrypting and decrypting on the hardware security module is expensive. So you've seen that when we made the calls out to the, to the key vault, there was a bit of latency in that operation happening and then the reply coming back. Part of that is because I've set up the cheapest um, Azure key vault I could. So it's not gonna be as performant as a what a production one might be, but you know there is a lot going on there. You're sending stuff over to a key vault, encrypting it, sending it back. So there is a latency. So what we want to do is use a more hybrid solution. So what this means is we'll do all of our encryption locally using AES, because it's nice and fast. We can keep it close to our application. But then what we'll do is our AES encryption keys will encrypt using the hardware security module. And then that means we can store our AES encrypted keys in a database if we needed, if we want to because they're encrypted with RSA on the key vault. Another good thing about this is it means that if you imagine you've got a web API and you're going to decrypt about 20 different items, for example, you could go into the API, you could decrypt your AES key using the key vault, so that's one operation towards your cost, and then those remaining 20 operations you just do with AES locally, so you're not incurring any financial cost with the key vault. Because you remember, most of the operations are charged in batches of 10,000, 
So it's a good way of keeping your Azure bill down as well, especially if you're running a very you know, high bandwidth system. So let's look at an example of that. Again, all the source code's available if you want to have a play around with it at a later date. So in here, I've got a, another helper class called AES Encryption. Two methods, encrypt and decrypt. It takes a byte array of the data I want to encrypt, a byte array of my key, which I'm going to generate, and something called an initialization vector, which is something that you pass into AES to help kickstart the encryption on the first block. So standard AES code uses uh, memory encrypto streams inside, but effectively we pass some data in here with a key in the IV. We'll get a byte array back with our encrypted data. And to decrypt it, we pass in the encrypted data, the key in the IV again, run the code, and then we get our encrypted data back out. So that's just some AES helper code that we're going to use. We've got another method down here called generate random number, which generates cryptographically secure random numbers in .NET. And I'm going to use that to create my encryption key and initialization vector. So we pass in a length, that's a length in bytes. So for our key, it's going to be 32 bytes or 256 bits. And then that will return a byte array of the desired length full of uh, random data. Okay, so if we look at the example then, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to create a key on the key vault, just like we did in the previous example. I'm then going to create an AES key, so that's 32 bytes, 32 bytes in length. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to send that um, key that I've just created to the key vault and ask it to be encrypted. So at this point here, we've got an encrypted AES key back. Now at that point, I could go and store that in a database or you know, put it somewhere safe. So if we imagine you know, some time's elapsed. So now maybe we've got an, a web API method that's being called. And we want to do some encryption and decryption operations. So the first thing we need to do is we need to recover that AES key. We need to decrypt it so we can use it. So I'm making a call out to the key vault with that encrypted key and specifying my key ID that we created a little earlier. And that gives me a decrypted um, AES key. And from that point onwards, you know, I generate my initialization vector and then I can encrypt locally using AES. So I have a message here that, oh, that says mega top secret stuff. It's a string, I convert it to a byte array. I encrypt it. Then I decrypt it straight away, and then I display the results, or convert the results so we can display it. So again, create the key. Create my AES key, 32 bytes. And then I'm going to go off to the key vault and encrypt that key. Right, so now I actually want to use that key for something else. So if you imagine this is, you know, some time later, a separate web call. So we come in, we first of all decrypt our key, create our initialization vector. Then at this point, I'm going to encrypt some data, but this is all happening locally now, so I'm not calling out to the key vault. So we're not incurring additional cost with the key vault. And AES is nice and fast, so I encrypt my data. And here we can see our encrypted text. We have to take my word for it, there's encrypted text in there, that's, a bit, that's quite small. And then you can see why I've decrypted it straight away. And it says mega top secret stuff. So that's quite a neat trick. So not only does it keep our costs down, it means we're using the performance and the efficiency of AES locally. So that's going to run nice and quickly. But we're also protecting that AES key using the key vault, which is quite a handy little technique. So an example where I've used this um, fairly recently, I was working for a fairly newish startup, it's an insurance claims management company. So we built a system that's a software as a service platform, so it's our system that we built and deployed. But what we do is we white label the system for insurance companies. So if you've got companies like, I don't know, AXA or Aviva sign up to use the sites, when their agents log on to the, you know, the agent's portal, it's all viewed in their colours and branding, so it looks like one of their systems. Then when the claimants are trying to resolve an insurance claim, they can also log into their version of the portal, and it again looks like the insurance company that they're a customer of. So it's a multi-tenant system with custom branding. 
So when we onboard an insurance company, the first thing we did was we would create a master key for that insurance company in the key vault. So if you had AXA, for example, all other, other insurance companies exist, if we take them, we'd create a key for them in the key vault, that then becomes their master key. <coughs> but then what we'd do is we would use that um, key wrapping technique where we would also generate an AES key or a series of AES keys for different purposes, uh, which we'd encrypted with their master key in the key vault, and then we stored that key in a database. So the feature of our system was that any personal identifiable information for any of their claimants, we, we always encrypted those fields at the record level in the database. So we was using a combination of um, SQL Server and Cosmos DB. So you might have a, a record in a database, but their name, address, phone number, date of birth, gender, all that sort of stuff would be encrypted. So this is broadly what it would look like. So you've got each tenant. So you've got four tenants, for example. Each one's got their own master key in the key vault. And in a database somewhere, we'd have a tenant ID. So that's the ID that relates to that particular company. We'd have a key ID, which is the key ID that refers to the key in the key vault. And then also in that table, we would have an encrypted version of their AES session key. Now, in actual reality, we had, I think it's four different AES keys we had for different purposes for each insurer. But for this example, let's just imagine we've got one. And what this meant was that effectively each of the insurance company's data, it, although it was all stored in the same database, it was effectively partitioned using security. So if for any um, unfortunate scenario, say tenant ID or tenant one, say, say for example their key got compromised in the key vault, I'm not quite sure how that would happen, but if it did, the exposure is just limited to their data that could potentially be decrypted because they wouldn't have any of the other keys for the other insurance companies. So this then, obviously, obviously advantages were local encryption operations were faster because we're keeping it close to you know, the servers where we're running our code. We decrypt the key using the HSM and store it in memory, so that reduced a lot of network hops and latency with the key vault, which is good because it is quite slow to use. <coughs> but it also meant it was very easy for us to rotate keys. So each of these insurance companies had different policies about how often you had to change master keys. So broadly, every you know, between 30 days and 90 days, you had to change those keys. This technique was actually quite useful for us. So if we imagine that we've encrypted all of the customer data using just that one key on the key vault, if we then go and change that key, you're in a situation where you've then got to go and re-encrypt all of the data in the database, which is not a nice task for someone to be given to do. But because we're using this kind of surrogate key here that we've created and stored in the database. If we went and changed the key for tenant four, the only thing we need to re-encrypt is this key down here. So we don't have to touch any of the data in the database, which was quite nice. So it meant we actually had a very fast and efficient um, key rotation policy for each of the insurance companies that was quite low risk. Because you, know, you just, you just re-encrypt this key here. We're not actually changing the AES key, we're just re-encrypting it. Okay. So key versioning then, so you know, we just talked about the idea that we can change keys in the key vault and then re-encrypt local keys in the database. It's kind of like the digital equivalent of changing the locks on your front door. So the one we just talked through then, so you know, you might have version one of a key, you use that to protect um, an AES key locally, but then you might introduce a new version of the key. So as I said, you only need to re-encrypt that one key in your database, which is quite nice. Another area where I've used this before is the idea of called incremental keys. And the way this works is you might have key version one, and then you might have, say, you know, a whole load of records that you encrypt with key version one, and then when you change to a new key, you don't change any of this data here, you just start using that key from that point forward in time. So that's called incremental keys. An example of where I've used that before in a system um, is anyone familiar with PCI DSS, the payment card regulations? Is that a thing in, in Denmark? Um, so it's a series of regulations we had to adhere to, and it's all about how you protect customers' card data, so credit and banking card data. So we built what was called a card token vault. So it was a separate system that ran on a separate network in the organization. And when customers provide us with their debit card details or credit card details, we would store them in this protected um, system so none of the other systems could directly access it. So the way this works is we would have a key, 
and then we'd encrypt, say for example, a thousand cards with that key. When we get, when we get to a thousand, we automatically generated a new key, and then we encrypted the next thousand cards with that key, and so on. The reason you do that is if any one of those keys ever got um, compromised or stolen, then you're limiting the exposure of data that can be decrypted down to a thousand cards, not millions of cards. That's just another example of where you can use different key versions. When you write keys into the key vault, they are versioned as well. So if you give it the same name, it does create a brand new version of it. So you can actually use historic key versions if you want to. If you don't specify a version number, you just get the latest key back when you, well, not back, when you, when you encrypt it, it does it with the latest key. Okay, so passwords. So we all know passwords aren't a particularly great thing, but they're kind of here to stay. It's probably one of the easiest ways for customers to authenticate with our systems. <coughs> so if you think about, you know, all the different password techniques that are out there, we can all agree that plain text passwords are the work of the devil and we never want to use them. The next best technique which people might use is to use hashed passwords. Anyone do password hashing? Do straight password hashing? Not that many that are, that are willing to admit to it. So, you know, that's been used quite a lot, but it is susceptible to brute force attacks where you just try billions of combinations until you get the correct hash. Or you could do a rainbow table or dictionary table attack, which is a pre-computed multi-gigabyte uh, list of passwords and hashes. As an example, um, website here, crackstation.net, you paste a SHA-256 hash of a password in the top there, and it will tell you what the password is. Next best technique is salted hashes. So a salt is where you generate uh, a, a random number, a random piece of entropy that you append onto the password, and then you hash the password of those two values. You do have to store the salt, but basically what you're trying to do is make dictionary tables and brute force attacks much harder to do against a password. Probably still one of the most common ways of storing passwords in systems at the moment. Does anyone do this particular technique? Yeah, a few people. So the next best one, I apologise for the emojis, I don't know why I put these in there. Um, the next best technique is to use something called a password-based key derivation function, or something like bcrypt. Sounds very complicated, but really it's not. So in .NET, we have a system called a password-based key derivation function. And what this is, is it's a, it's a password hashing function. So you put the password into one side, you put the salt in, and then you give it a number of iterations value. And what this is going to do is it's going to repeatedly hash that password, depending on what that number is. So if you put 10,000 in there, it's going to hash the password 10,000 times. And the reason we do this is we're trying to slow down algorithmically the password hashing process. Because one of the common ways of cracking passwords is to use tools like Hashcat and powerful GPU hardware on your PC, like GT GTX cards. And they can test billions or calculate billions of hashes per second. So if we algorithmically slow down the hashing process, you can reduce that from billions down to, say, 100 or 10 that you can do per second, or passwords that you can attempt to crack per second. So if you've ever logged onto some websites where you put your password in and it feels like you're waiting two or three seconds for anything to happen, chances are they're doing an iterated password hash like this um, behind the scenes. So in .NET, this is very easy to use. There's a very snappily named class called RFC2898 derived bytes. If you're familiar with RFC specs, it's completely obvious what it does. But for most normal people, it's not. So it's quite easy to miss it. So you pass in your byte array of your password, you pass in the salt and a number of iterations value, <coughs> call get bytes, and then you get the hash password back. The reason you return or do get bytes 20 is because internally it uses SHA-1, not SHA-256. And that returns a 20 byte hash code. So you only need 20 bytes. The higher the iteration value, the slower the hashing is going to be. And so I taught a workshop over the last couple of days and we was playing around with some of the different values you put in there. I think I put 10 million in at one point and it took like nearly 10 seconds for it to generate the hash. So of course you need to be careful what number you put in there. It becomes an application design decision. You know, what's an acceptable delay to wait? You know, if you think it's okay to wait three seconds, you might put a value of around 500,000 in there. It's kind of, or a million in there. But it's something you have to um, play around with. Is that 
light is solved where it will be like the number of iterations will be unique per per hash or is that like a, an application wide number? Okay, it's up to you. You, you could I mean you could have different number of iterations values that you use per customer or per class of user. That's entirely up to you. Okay, so you'd think we're good at this point. You know, password-based key derivation functions are a recommended way of doing it. It's what OWASP recommends. But actually, we can use the key vault just to give us an extra little bit of protection when using um, a technique like this. So if we think of the salt, you know, it's, it could be a 32-byte random number that we've generated. So we could, if we wanted to, use the local key wrapping technique and actually encrypt the salt before we store it in our database. Because you do need to store the salt, you have to provide the same salt when you recompute the hash. So we could encrypt it. And also, the number of iterations value, you know, if someone's going to try and crack your password, they need to know what that value is. Now, the security of a password-based key derivation function isn't dependent on keeping that value secret. But you probably don't want to advertise it either. It just makes it a little bit harder. So actually storing it as a secret in your key vault might be something that's quite useful to you because it's a configuration item. don't necessarily want everyone to know what it is. So why not store it as a secret in your uh, key vault? Now there are obviously performance implications to doing this. So if we're going to ca calculate a salt, sorry, if we're going to calculate a password using this technique, then we've got two operations to the key vault. So you might decide, and this is what we did at the insurance company, that we weren't going to do this for every single user where we encrypt the salt and store the number of iterations away. But for people that had kind of like super user admin access into the system, we took this extra level of protection because obviously you can do quite a lot of damage with their accounts. So we used it for a certain class of users. But you know, it, it's all there to make a potential hacker's life a lot harder. You know, if they steal your password hashing table, if the salt's encrypted and they have no idea what the number of iterations value is, you've just made their life a lot harder, which is good. Because ultimately, we want them to get bored and move on to someone else and, and leave our company alone. OK, so let's look at a, a demo of doing that. All the codes here, if you want to play around with it. So similar to the previous example, so I've got a class here for generating a random number. I've got the password-based key derivation function implementation here. You know, it's just a few lines of code, so it's nice and straightforward. And I've got the key vault uh, boilerplate helper code from the previous examples. So in this example, I, I am going to encrypt the salt and I am going to store the number of iterations in the key vault using that technique we just discussed. So I come in, I create a key in the key vault. Each of these examples is self-contained, so I create new keys every time. Obviously, you're probably not necessarily going to do that in your system. So I create the key, I then generate a salt, so I'm generating a 32-byte salt, so it's a nice big long random number which I'm appending to the passwords. I encrypt the salt with a key vault, and then I store the number of iterations, in this case I've set it to 20,000, but I store that in the key vault as well. So now if we imagine, you know, some time has elapsed, someone's trying to log onto the system. So the first thing we need to do when we check their password is we need to decrypt that salt. So we send the decrypted salt to the key vault and ask it to decrypt it for us. We then call out to the key vault and we say, can you give me the number of iterations value that I need? So that returns 20,000 there. Then at that point, we can just carry on with the password hash as normal. So let's run that. So create a key. generate a local key, or the, the salt in this case, encrypt the salt. Whoops. Helps if I run the right project, doesn't it? Let's try that again. OK, so create a key, create my salt, encrypt the salt with the key vault. So now we have an encrypted salt, and then we store a number of iterations in the key vault. So that encrypted salt, you know, we probably converted it to a base64 string and stored it in a database somewhere. Okay, so now we want to um, 
check a password. So the first thing we need to do is to decrypt the salt for that user. We need to return the number of iterations value back from the key vault, so it's return 20,000. We then have our password, which is password, because I've cunningly used the numbers to change the vowels. Um, okay, then we call hash password. That was a joke about the password before. No one laughed, that fell a bit flat. <laughs> so I'm now going to hash the password, so we've got our Password is a byte array, we've got the salt that we've just decrypted, and we've got the number of iterations, which is 20,000. I run it through RFC 2898 derived bytes, call get bytes on it, and that returns us a password hash. So then what you do at that point is you compare the value of that hash to what you've got stored in your password table. If they match, you know the user's put the correct password in. If they don't match, then they've typed the wrong password in. So it's quite a handy little trick, just to give you that extra little bit of protection around passwords. As I said, you might not want to do it for every user because you will be incurring costs with the key vault. But in the example where I used it, we had a level of super users within the company I was working at and within each um, insurance company as well. So we use that technique for those people because obviously they've got quite a lot of access. So we just gave them that extra little sort of veneer of protection around their password. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about then is um, digital signing and digital signatures. So in cryptography, broadly, there's kind of four core pillars to cryptography that we talk about. So you've got confidentiality, which is you know, encrypting data, making something confidential. We have integrity, which is what we use things like SHA-256 for. You know, so if you have some data, you calculate a hash for it, send that data to someone else with the hash. You recalculate the hash of the data, compare them. If they're the same, then you know that data hasn't been tampered with when it's been sent. Authentication, we use things like um, hash message authentication codes. So very similar to hashing, except you provide a key to the hashing function. So if you want someone to calculate the same hash um, somewhere else, they have to have that key to calculate the same hash. But then the final pillar is called non-repudiation. And this is where we use techniques like digital signatures for. So a good way of des describing non-repudiation is to think about contracts that we might sign in real life. So if you're buying um, a house, for example, you might sign the contract with a solicitor. Someone witnesses the contract, so you know that you're going to buy the house for a certain value. If then later on you try and turn around and say, actually, no, I want to pay $20,000 know, less, they can say, well, no, we've got this contract as proof. So that's what digital signature is about. It's about providing proof that someone's done something and we use cryptography for doing that. So a digital signature is a mathematical technique used to validate the authenticity and integrity of a message, software or digital document. Has anyone heard of a service called DocuSign? Yeah, so DocuSign is a place where you can sign, um, electronically sign contracts between multiple parties. So that you know, if you then try to refute what's in that contract later on, they've got digital proof that you signed that contract. It's exactly what digital signatures are for. Our key vault lets us do that quite simply, which is really good. So when we do a digital signature, there's three operations that we need. So we need to, to be able to generate signing keys. Well, we've already seen how to create keys in the key vault, so we've covered that already. You need a signing algorithm. This is where you pass in some data and you say, create me a digital signature of that data. And then you need a way of verifying that digital signature later. So there's a verification method where you pass in the data and the signature if it returns true, you know that the signature is valid for that piece of data. If it returns false, then you don't trust that signature. Typically what you do is you would have some data. Instead of creating the signature of that data directly, you create a hash of that data first, and it's that hash that you create the signature for. If you're doing digital signatures yourself in .NET, then the two classes you use are RSA PKCS1 Signature Formatter and RSA PKCS1 Signature Deformatter. So they're the two classes you'd use if you're doing this manually yourself. But luckily we don't need to use those because they're a bit of a mouthful to try and pronounce. So Keyvault offers digital signatures natively, so we don't need to use that formatter class, which is really good. And as you can guess, it's probably quite simple to do. So let's take a look. 
Okay, so in this class, I've got all the same boilerplate stuff as before. I've got a separate uh, little helper class here for doing a SHA-256 hash. So that's how you do hashing in .NET. You have a byte array of the data you want to hash. You call create, a static create method on the SHA-256 object, and you just call compute hash on that object. And that creates your, your hash code. So in the example here, so again, I'm creating a key. So this is the keys I'm going to use for signing, same as what we've done previously. I've got a very important document I want to sign. In this case, it's just a string, but it could be you know, a PDF file or any kind of file. <coughs> so I create a hash of that um, piece of information. So I convert it to a byte array and I hash it. And we call that the document digest. That's the kind of correct term for it, but it's just a hash. Then what I do is I get that hash and my key ID and I send it to the key vault, I call the sign method. And then the, what we get back is a byte array of our digital signature. So you could then go and you know, base64 encode it, store it away in the database. And then later on, if you want to verify that that digital signature is valid for that piece of data, or you want to make sure that data hasn't changed or no one has changed a contract, you call verify. You pass in the hash of that data and the signature and it will return true or false. So just quickly before I run it, it's giving an example of where I've used this. So in the insurance system that I talked about, we had two databases. We had a SQL database and a Cosmos database. Cosmos is a document store, so you can just have objects in C Sharp. You can serialize them into JSON and you just store them in that store. So when we settled an insurance claim with a customer, you know, there's an interaction between the insurance customer and the claimant. They've crashed their car. You know, we've, we, know, we know the age of their car, we know how many miles are on the clock, and we say, okay, your car is worth 5,000 pounds. The customer at that point says, mm, okay, that's fine. They hit a button to say they agree to the settlement. And what we did is we have a settlement document which contains all of the information about their claim and the final settlement value, and we create a digital signature effectively of that document. We store that information along with the signature that we created in Key Vault in that Cosmos DB. So that's kind of like a document that represents their claim settlement. So if further down the line the customer says, actually no, I want £7,000, not five, and it's like, well no, you hit accept, and we've got a digital signature that's signing this document that proves you said it was okay to pay £5,000. Yeah? So that signature gives you proof of that document. Digital signature is also valid in many courts in a lot of countries. So if it ever went to court and you've got a valid digital signature for that document that says you're going to pay £5,000, not seven, that will stand up in court. So that's kind of a, an example of where we use this. And as you've seen here, it's just a few lines of code to create and verify the signature. So again, we come in, we create our key. I have my document, which is just a string in this case. I hash that document, and then I can call out to the key vault to sign the document. So this byte array is now my digital signature. And then I can go and verify that digital signature, and it returns true. So let's, for example, do that again. Let's create the digital signature. So let's now change the hash. So let's imagine that I've changed the document and I've recreated a new hash. So I'm now, you know, falsifying that document. So let's just change one of the values here. So now that hash isn't going to match with that digital signature when I go to verify it because I've changed the document. I've asked for £7,000 instead of 5000 So if we now go and verify that signature on the key vault, it's going to come back and say false because we know that that signature doesn't match the data that we signed it with. Okay, so those are the six patterns I wanted to cover. I think I'm literally just about to run out of time, so let's do the summary. <coughs> so we started off by saying, you know, data breaches are inevitable. They're gonna happen to everyone at some point, probably. The number's getting bigger, doesn't really surprise me. The bit that does surprise me is the fact that we've got 4% of those data breaches were secure data breaches. So we want that number to be higher. If your data gets stolen from your company, you want data to be encrypted. So they're inevitable. You need to get into the mindset change of it's not if, it's when it's going to happen. 
And to solve this problem, we've used Azure Key Vault as a way of protecting our keys and doing RSA encryption on the Key Vault as well. Microsoft does that using the Thales Enshield Connect hardware, so they've taken the hit on buying these things and they effectively rent them out to us for not a lot of money. Very easy to set up, so they, all the key documentation starts at that address there. Their documentation is actually pretty good for Key Vault, which, is, uh, which makes a change. And we looked at six broad patterns. So multiple environments, we said that you don't want to share Key Vault instances from production with other environments. You want to have separate instances. Configuration of secrets is about storing secrets on the Key Vault. So it works as a key value pair store. So you can store database passwords, API keys securely on the Key Vault to keep them out of your config files. Local key wrapping was a technique where we do AES encryption locally, but we protect our AES keys using the Key Vault which means not only do we have faster encryption locally, but we're also reducing the number of network hops to the key vault, which keeps the costs down. Key versioning as well. So we talked about the fact that you can, using that key wrapping technique, it makes it very easy to rotate keys and change keys, because you only have to re-encrypt that AES key locally. You don't have to re-encrypt all of your data, which is quite nice. We looked at some techniques for password hashing, and we looked at the password-based key derivation function. But using the key vault, we can go one step further and we can hash our, sorry, we can encrypt our salt values and we can store the number of iterations value as a secret if we want. So it just gives out that extra little veneer of security. And then we finally looked at digital signatures and how easy they are to create um, with the key vault. So we've covered quite a lot quite quickly. Um, if you are interested in using this, please feel free to take the sample code and have a play around with it. Each application is completely self-contained, so it should be nice and easy to run. The demo key vault that I've created for this, I'll keep it up and running so you can use it to play around with, provided nobody abuses it and starts sending ridiculous amounts of keys to it. Um, in which case I will have to change the credentials, but you know, there's one there that you can just have a quick play around with if you want, so you don't have to go and create one just yet if you don't want to. Um, some additional information, so I've got a course on Plural site called Practical Cryptography in .NET. So if you want a good overview of a lot of the .NET um, cryptography classes, that course is a good place to start with. And I've also got a course called Enterprise Data Encryption with Azure Revealed, which talks at a higher level some of the stuff we've talked at today. Obviously, we've gone into more depth here. If you're into things like blockchains, I've done a course called Blockchain Principles and Practices, which is kind of like a computer science class. It talks about how the fundamental data structures and algorithms operate in a blockchain. So it gives you that kind of information about what these things actually are. So when your CEO turns around and says, I want a blockchain, you can actually understand a bit more about what they actually are and what they mean. And I've also got a book that I've just released with A Press called Applied Cryptography in .NET. So it's there if anyone finds that sort of thing useful. So with that, thank you very much. I think we're just on time, so thank you.